Hey, hi, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Compass Seminar. Today, our presenter is Rebecca Evans. She graduated, or she is a current PhD student in the NPO department with Professor Dave Nolan, and her PhD work focuses on numerical simulations of diurnal and upward propagating gravitation, gravity waves and tropical cyclones. She previously graduated from the University of Oxford with a combined master's and bachelor's in earth sciences, and she's originally from um, Northern Ireland. She has a peer-reviewed paper in the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences. She has given a couple of talks at international conferences, including the European Geophysical Union and American Meteorolog Meteorological Society. Additionally, she's led three tropical um, division or sorry, research division tropical weather map discussions uh, with HRD and NOAA. She's won um, some awards, including best scientific content for two presentations in two different years and um, the TA Excellence Award in 2018 and 2019 academic year. She's also the leader of Canes on Canes, which is the University of Miami's outreach program um, that discusses uh, hurricanes. And she's really led that organization for the last couple of years. So um, today she's going to be giving a talk, um, which is about her PhD research called Diurnal Oscillations and Tropical Cyclones and Their Influence on Gravity Waves in Linear and Nonlinear Models. All right, Rebecca, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction, Anne, and thank you all for being here in what I realize is probably the worst possible day I could have scheduled this. Um, uh, so thank you all for being here and special thanks to all of my committee who managed to make it uh, today. It's uh, very nice to have everyone assembled. So today I will be talking to you about my favorite topic, uh, which is diurnal oscillations in tropical cyclones and their influence on gravity waves in linear and nonlinear models. Um, so just a bit of... Oops. Just a bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm firstly going to give you an overview of gravity waves and the diurnal cycle in tropical cyclones um, in general. And then um, for my uh, first major results, I'm going to um, talk about how diurnal heating in tropical cyclones produces gravity waves in a linear model. Then I'm going to talk about diurnal variability in tropical cyclones in a more general sense in a nonlinear model. And then for the third uh, part, uh, which I haven't really done yet, so it's mostly conjecture. Um, I will talk a little bit about how diurnal variability in tropical cyclones may influence gravity waves and their propagation into the, into the stratosphere. So essentially the first part is largely about um, diurnal forcing producing gravity waves. The second part is about diurnal variability in general. And the third part is connecting the two. So I'm gonna start off easy with just some pretty photos. Um, here's a photo of Typhoon Maysac from um, the International Space Station that uh, Terry Verts took in 2015. And uh, you can see a um, major uh, hurricane right here, but you can also see, um, I hope people can see my mouse. Um, you can also see there's some uh, ripples right here and uh, those are gravity waves. So if we take a little zoom in um, on the same uh, hurricane, you can see there's these ripples up here. And uh, those are gravity waves, and you can kind of see them a little bit better with these blue lines that I've put on. Um, gravity waves are very important phenomena in the atmosphere, um, and they are produced by um, over mountains. They're also produced by deep convection. Um, so deep convection produces gravity waves, and they propagate at different angles depending on their frequency. So the higher frequency the wave, the more vertically it propagates. Um, these waves are very important as they propagate to substantial distances from the source and contribute to the momentum budget on the, in the atmosphere. So um, similar to a wave in the ocean, as it approaches the shore, it grows in height and then it breaks. Um, convective gravity waves, as they propagate upwards into the atmosphere, they propagate into um, areas of lower density. So the wave grows in amplitude and then it breaks and its momentum is um, contributed into the mean flow of the atmosphere. So this momentum flux can increase or decrease the speed of large scale winds in the stratosphere, which can affect the global climate and weather. Propagation of gravity waves through the stratosphere depends on the background wind profile, the storm translation speeds, the characteristics of the conve um, convective system, and a whole host of other things. They are in general a very complicated phenomenon. In tropical cyclones specifically, um, they add a little bit to their complication because uh, tropical cyclones have a broad spectrum of scales. They have individual um, convective selves, and then they have the larger structures of the eye wall and the rain bands. And accordingly, this produces a very broad spectrum of gravity waves. 
Gravity waves in the stratosphere from tropical cyclones have been um, observed for some time. Sato in 1993 looked at, excuse me, radar observations of high frequency gravity waves before and during the passage of Typhoon Kelly. Tratt and Cohen 2018 um, used observations from AIRS, the Atmospheric Infrared Sounder, finding that gravity waves from tropical cyclones are prevalent and propagate to vast horizontal range. And Chen Ming uh, and Co in 2010 found that the wave energy density above Cyclone Dino was 30% above climatology. So it seems as though um, hurricanes produce gravity waves and that these could be important for the momentum budget of the atmosphere. We also think that these could be modulated by the diurnal cycle. Um, so diurnal variability um, can cause a diurnal cycle in deep convection, which would affect the production of gravity waves. Um, diurnal varying tangential and radial wind speeds could affect, affect the shearing or filtering um, or breaking of these propagating gravity waves. And a broad spectrum of gravity waves can also be produced in response to or modulated by time varying oscillatory heating, such as the diurnal cycle of solar radiation. That's a bit of a wordy sentence, but all that means is that the, um, the day night um, cycle of heating can in and of itself produce a broad spectrum of gravity waves. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about the diurnal cycle in a more general sense. And all that it is, is a cycle or oscillation with a period of one day. And hurricanes have a diurnal cycle because day and night exist. The diurnal cycle has been shown in many studies to be very, very important for the structure, outflow and intensity of tropical cyclones. For example, for some time, um, there have been studies on the diurnal cycle, which have shown that the area of the cirrus canopy changes over the course of a day, where it's bigger, uh, the cirrus canopy is larger in area in the middle of the day. Um, and also there are pulses of motion within um, the cirrus canopy, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. We know that the diurnal cycle um, of solar radiation creates gravity waves in uh, one of my studies, which I'll talk about later. Uh, we know that it modifies the intensity of convection and therefore the amount of rainfall. We know that it modifies the strength of the inflow and the outflow. So the diurnal cycle of solar radiation influences the entire primary and secondary circulation of hurricanes. So it seems like it's quite an important thing. So uh, diurnal pulses of convection have been seen um, in like every major hurricane. And this paper by Donnie and Co in 2014 sparked a real resurgence of interest in the topic of the diurnal cycle. So what he did is he looked at every major hurricane from 2001 to 2014 in the North Atlantic Ocean and found that a pulse of convection forms in the cirrus canopy um, inner core around the time of local sunset. So here is uh, Hurricane Emily around the time of local sunset. And you can see all these red colors mean there's a pulse of upward motion. And if we fast forward uh, to later on, the pulse propagates radially outwards overnight. So by sunset, you can see all the red colors have propagated much further out. So uh, this sparked a real resurgence in, the, um, in interest in the diurnal cycle in general, because uh, you know, people wanted to know how important is um, this phenomenon in general? Um, how does this even happen in the first place? By what mechanisms does the diurnal cycle enter uh, tropical cyclones? So uh, the mechanisms is really the key here. And that's something that I, I particularly would really like to understand. And there's four main mechanisms that have been proposed um, for how the diurnal cycle can get into hurricanes. And I'm gonna explain each one in turn. So to understand the mechanisms, we first need to know what the secondary circulation of a hurricane actually looks like. So here's a hypothetical hurricane that I made earlier. And you can see um, the eye wall is right here, the eyes in the middle. The cirrus canopy is this bit up here and uh, the rain bands are, are down here. So we have um, the secondary circulation is the inflow at the surface, the upward motion in the eye wall, the outward motion in the cirrus canopy, and then the subsidence in the outer part of the storm. And then we also have um, the cyclonic flow that um, you know, makes up the tangential wind field of the hurricane. So this is what the, um, the, the primary circulation is this green arrow, and the secondary circulation is this overturning right here. And this is what we believe to be um, the most important way that um, hurricanes are affected by the diurnal cycle. And the reason for that is that the cirrus canopy up here is um, very opaque to solar radiation. So it's um, heated during the day and it cools at night and this can um, affect the secondary circulation. So we'll talk about each mechanism one by one. Um, the first mechanism we'll talk about is uh, differential cooling or heating. I'll use heating and cooling interchangeably, but they functionally mean the same thing. 
So um, what this relies on is that the colloidal region of a TC um, heats and cools at a different rate than the surrounding cloud-free region. So during the day, um, the, the cloudy region heats up, the cloud, uh, cloud-free cloud region outside it also heats up, but at a slightly different rate. Secondary circulation is just chugging along. But at night, we have a slightly different story, which is where um, the, the cloud, cloudy region stays re uh, reasonably warm, but the cloud-free region outside it um, cools very, very substantially, which drives a much faster overturning circulation. So this horizontal gradient in heating, um, in heating rate drives a large overturning circulation. And the intensity of the secondary circulation depends on the time of day, resulting in a diurnal cycle. So that's the differential cooling mechanism. The second one is known as the lapse rate. So um, here we have our hypothetical hurricane again. And so during the day, the upper part of it gets heated. Um, this decreases the lo local lapse rate and stabilizes the air column, resulting in somewhat reduced upward motion in the eye wall. And you know, just a regular secondary circulation. At night, the radiative cooling of the cloud tops increases the local lapse rate, which destabilizes the air column, enhancing upward motion in the eye wall. And this can also um, speed up the secondary circulation at night. So that's the lapse rate mechanism. The third one is um, inertial stability. And this mechanism was invoked um, to explain why there might be enhanced radial flow at the level of the cirrus canopy. So inertial stability is just a metric of how, uh, how much flow can spread radially. So a higher inertial stability means flow is confined very close to the inner core. A lower inertial stability means that the flow can spread out more. So the idea here is that a diurnal cycle in the cirrus canopy area could be explained by a diurnal cycle in the inertial stability in the cirrus canopy. So if for some reason the tangential wind speed was reduced in the cirrus canopy, the inertial stability could be weaker, allowing for enhanced radial propagation of a pulse. And then the last mechanism that we'll talk about, oh sorry, the last mechanism that we'll talk about is a trapped gravity wave. So gravity waves, as we've discussed, are produced by convection in the eye wall and rain bands. If we have radiative cooling of the cloud tops, and we also have strong wind shear in the level of the outflow, this could potentially stabilize the upper level environment enough to trap or reflect some gravity waves. So if we have a gravity wave that's trying to propagate upwards, it may encounter a very stable environment and be forced to propagate radially like so. So this is another mechanism that has been proposed to explain the diurnal pulse. So let's ask ourselves, why do we care about any of this at all? Or why do we care about understanding mechanisms? So understanding the changes, the diurnal changes in hurricane structure, intensity, and amount of rain has obvious implications for coastal communities. The good thing about understanding the diurnal cycle is that it would add an element of predictability to forecasting because we have a very good understanding of um, you know, the rising and setting of the sun. And the, um, we also would like to understand this because the outflow could act as a filter for gravity waves, which could in turn influence the global climate through modulating stratospheric flow and oscillations. So what do we wanna know specifically? We wanna know exactly how a hurricane changes on a diurnal timescale. Um, so we wanna know the timings of changes and the magnitudes of variability. And the reason for that is we wanna know what that means for the mechanisms by which the diurnal cycle can influence tropical cyclones. And then the last thing we want to know is what does that mean for gravity waves in the troposphere and stratosphere, which brings us cleanly to chapter one. So uh, for this, we're going to discuss how does diurnal heating affect the production of gravity waves in tropical cyclones. So what we want to, want to know specifically is where does heating vary diurnally? How does that heating rate evolve throughout the day? What waves are, uh, and responses are produced in, in response to, excuse me, the heating? And can these waves and responses explain the diurnal pulse in the cirrus canopy? There have been previous studies on the topic of uh, responses to heating in tropical cyclones in reasonably idealized models. Um, so Willoughby in 2009 looked at the transition between balanced and radiating waves with low periods, but none as low as the diurnal period or the um, diurnal frequency. Um, Navarro and Hakem in 2016 looked at diurnal forcing in an idealized model and they treated diurnal forcing as a sine wave, finding there is a diurnal cycle in intensity in this idealized model. Navarro and Cohen in 2017 looked at uh, secondary circulations produced by diurnal heating in the cirrus canopy using the modified Sawyer Eliasson equations. And, uh, excuse me, if you'll remember from dynamics. 
and the Sawyer Eliasson equations solve for the um, secondary circulation response to a steady state heat source. So they modified it so that the heat source evolved with time. And then O'Neill and co in 2017 looked at balanced and radiating waves um, in CM1 of diurnal and semi-diurnal frequency. So we wanna to add to this body of work using a linear model named 3 dv pass, and we're gonna study balanced and radiating responses to diurnal heating. And uh, we wanna look at the three main sources of diurnal heating, um, which are radiative heating in the cirrus canopy and eye wall and moist convective heating in the eye wall. So um, the, we need to, we take this linear model and we need to force it in space and time. And we, the, we wanted to do that in the most realistic way possible. Um, so to do that, we uh, looked in detail at the hurricane nature run, which I'm gonna talk about a lot today. Um, and I'll uh, talk more about it in the second chapter. Um, so we looked at output from the hurricane nature run to look at the spatial pattern of heating in a radius height framework. Um, and then we also looked at the diurnal um, evolution of this heating. So now I'm gonna um, tell you a little bit about what heating looks like in the hurricane nature run. Um, so we have found, um, so what I'm gonna show you on the right hand side, and um, these are uh, plots with the x-axis is radius and the y-axis is height. And the red colors show you where the diurnal cycle of heating is strongest. The upper panel is showing you radiative heating, which is short wave plus long wave heating. And the lower panel is showing you moist convective heating or heating from latent heat. Um, so in the upper panel for radiative heating, you can see that there's two areas of the hurricane that are affected um, by the diurnal cycle of radiative heating. So we have the eye wall right here, which has a weak diurnal cycle and radiative heating. And then we have the cirrus canopy up here. And yeah, you can see that because the cirrus canopy is very optically opaque, it has a very strong diurnal cycle um, in how much it gets heated by the sun. Um, in the bottom panel, you can see that there is, it's quite complicated, but there's a uh, rain band heating signal down here, which we're largely going to ignore. And then uh, we have this eye wall signal right here where the eye wall has a very um, strong diurnal cycle in how much it's heated um, and cooled by latent heating over the course of a day. So we have three main diurnal cycles. We have um, radiative heating in the cirrus canopy and, uh, and in the eye wall, we have radiative heating and we have moist convective heating. So these three things together show us that we have three sources of diurnal um, heating in tropical cyclones. Um, we also wanted to know how that varies over the course of a day. So we made a time series in each of these boxes and then just um, average, like grouped them by day and made a daily composite of what that heating looked like. So what we, so what, uh, this is a little complicated, but essentially what we wanted to do is we wanted to take as realistic heating as possible and put it into a very simplistic linear model to see what kind of realistic heating would produce um, radiating and balanced responses in a linear model. So I'll now describe the model a little bit. The model is a 3D VPAS or the three-dimensional vortex per perturbation analysis and simulation. It is a linear non-hydrostatic model that uses the vortex analytic equations. Um, so the, the domain is shown on the right-hand side. It extends to a radius of 800 kilometers. Everything is an, an axisymmetric framework. Radius of 800 kilometers and a height of 20 kilometers. It's a closed domain and the upper and outer parts of the domain have a Gaussian sponge to prevent any waves being reflected off the edge of the domain. The basic state vortex is a um, modified Rankine vortex that looks like this, just a very classical wind profile for a hurricane. And uh, the strongest winds are shown um, here at the surface and the, strong, the, wind, the strongest winds slope outwards with height. And this is the radius of maximum wind. So if we follow the mice, you can see where the radius of maximum wind is at every height. So what we do is we take this hurricane, we add in the heat forcing um, that we find in the hurricane nature run. And then we look at the waves or the W prime that is uh, produced in response to this heating. So I'm gonna show you what the heating, heat forcing looks like that we actually put in the 3dB pass. So if you re remember, we have three main diurnal cycles of heating um, from the hurricane nature run. We have moist convective heating in the eye wall, radiative heating in the eye wall, and radiative heating in the cirrus canopy. So essentially what we did is we designed these little heat bubbles to look as close as possible to um, the heat forcing from the hurricane nature run. So the blue line is the radius of maximum wind and the heat bubble right here is the eye wall. And you can see that it looks pretty similar to the eye wall from the uh, hurricane nature run. So we take this heat bubble 
and we force it to cool down and heat up over the course um, of four days with, um, this is what one of the days would look like. And you can see it's a smooth sinusoidal wave. Um, so moist convective heating in real hurricanes varies over the course of the, um, one day with this smooth sinusoidal wave. Um, radiative heating in the eye wall, we took the exact same heat bubble, but instead we forced it to heat up and cool down with this diurnal cycle, which is the, di the classical diurnal cycle for radiative heating. So there's um, no heating overnight, there's actually cooling overnight, then sun rises right here, and then you have heating up during the day, this is noon, and then it cools back down again, and this is sunset. Um, and then we do the exact same thing for the cirrus canopy. So we take a little um, heat bubble that looks like this and we force it to heat up and cool down over the course of a day with a diurnal cycle that looks like this. So we have three simulations that we did in 3db pass. So we'll look at some results now. Um, so the first simulation we'll look at is moist convective heating in the eye wall. This is the time series on the bottom for what the moist convective heating um, looks like over the course of a day. So we have our heat forcing right here. And if we just uh, play this forward, what we're looking at is the vertical motion um, it produced in response to the heat bubble. So um, right here is at the peak heating and right at the peak heating, you can see that in the bubble, there is um, a very strong upward motion and there is a downward motion either side um, to compensate for this upward motion. There's some very weak downward motion in the cirrus canopy and then a little bit accumulates at the edge of the domain, but doesn't bounce back. And then if we uh, march forward to the maximum cooling, you can see that the opposite is true. There's downward motion in, this, in the eye wall, upward motion either side, and upward motion in the cirrus canopy. But if we start from the start and play this forward, you can see that there's not a lot going on in the cirrus canopy. These, um, when these uh, vertical motion speeds are extremely small, and there doesn't appear to be much of a radiating signal. So what this shows us is that um, moist convective heating in the eye wall produces a balanced response, i.e. not a radiating wave response. And it's a very weak response in the region of the cirrus canopy. So let's look at um, the same heat bubble, but for radiative heating. So now we're taking the heat bubble in the eye wall and we're heating and cooling it with this diurnal cycle. So if we play this forward, you can see that it's very similar with a couple of small exceptions. So I'll just pause this. Okay, so let's go back. This is sunset. Um, so uh, the eye wall has been cooling for some time. And if we play it forward, right after sunset, you can now see that there's um, high frequency waves that are radiating away from the eye wall. And then if we march over to sunrise um, and, uh, and play it forward, you can see the same thing. that You have these high frequency waves that are radiating um, away from the eye wall. The highest frequency waves radiate pretty much directly downwards and the lower frequency waves radiate more horizontally. And so what this tells us is that these sharp inflection points at sunset and sunrise produce high frequency waves which radiate away from the eye wall. But again, um, the heat forcing is inside the radius of maximum wind. Much of the response is still balanced. There is a radiating signal, but it's very weak. So uh, the shape of the temporal forcing doesn't really matter that much in the eye wall because the inertial stability is so high that the low frequency waves are still not able to radiate. And there's some high frequency waves that, ma um, that make it out. But honestly, it doesn't seem like they're that you know, exciting. Um, so now if we look at radiative heating in the cirrus canopy, you can see a very different story. So the, remember we have this heat bubble um, up here. Um, which is being forced to heat and cool with this diurnal cycle. So as we play this forward, you can see that our, um, the vertical motion response dominates pretty much the entire cyclone. So uh, while this is being heated during the day, there's strong upward motion in the region of the cirrus canopy and downward motion either side. So you get this large overturning circulation, very strong overturning circulation in the area of the cirrus canopy. And you can also see um, that there's signals that are able to radiate pretty much throughout the entire cyclone. So if we play this forward and pause right after um, sunset, you can see that there's um, high frequency waves that are able to radiate throughout the entire cyclone. So what this tells us is that um, whenever you radiatively heat and cool the cirrus canopy, you get diurnal signals in the entire cyclone. The radiating signal do, um, dominates outside the radius of maximum wind as the forcing is outside the radius of maximum wind. And the primary thing that this tells us is that the diurnal pulse in the cirrus canopy, excuse me, does not originate from diurnal forcing um, of convection in the eye wall. Um, so what that means is that the um, eye wall motion 
is not the thing that produces a response in the serous canopy. The thing that produces a response in the serous canopy is heating that occurs in the serous canopy. So to conclude chapter one, um, how does diurnal forcing affect waves in tropical cyclones? You have uh, low frequency responses are balanced throughout most of the cyclone. High frequency responses are radiating. Responses to eye wall diurnal heating are mostly confined to the inner core. Diurnal heating in the serous canopy can produce a radiating response throughout the entire cyclone. And uh, most importantly, diurnal pulses in the serous canopy do not originate in the eye wall, but instead originate from the diurnal cycle in the serous canopy itself. And if you want to see more on this topic, you can consult the, the paper that I had published in JAS last year, um, Evans and Nolan, 2019. So let's move on to chapter two. More generally, how do tropical cyclones vary on a diurnal timescale? So what we want to know is the magnitude and phase of diurnal variability and what this tells us about mechanisms of diurnal variability. So just real quick, I'm going to remind you again of what those mechanisms were. The first was the differential heating cooling mechanism shown on the top left. The second was the lapse rate mechanism. Third was inertial stability and four was a trapped gravity wave. There have been previous studies that have um, talked about diurnal uh, variability in tropical cyclones in a more general way. And uh, this work aims to develop on the finding of Dunyan and Co in 2019, who did a thorough analysis of diurnal variability in, the, in Hurricane Nature Run 1. And that Hurricane Nature Run is where we got our inspiration for the heat forcing for 3 dB pass. So um, this is a very thorough paper and that they uh, talked in a, um, uh, they talked about how um, Hurricane Nature Run 1 varies on a diurnal timescale, and they discovered the diurnal squall, which we'll talk a lot of, about a little bit later. So we want to add to this body of work by comparing it to other high resolution simulations and analyzing them in a slightly different way. And we also want to confirm whether the diurnal variability in other simulations um, agrees with what we have, or rather whether our um, results validate other studies. So an example of one of those studies is shown on the right hand side. And uh, this study is um, Rupert and O'Neill in 2019, and they used a nonlinear model called ICON LEM or large eddy model in radiative convective equilibrium. And uh, they find that the um, pa spatial pattern of the secondary circulation depended on the time of day. So this is um, three o'clock local time in the middle of the night. And you can see that there's really strong inflow and a really deep uh, secondary circulation like so. And then in the middle of the day, um, the, the outflow is a lot stronger and higher up. There's a little bit of a mid-level inflow and the surface inflow is slightly weaker during the middle of the day. So what we wanna know is um, we wanna compare the results of Dunyan and Co to another simulation. And we also wanna check whether this, the simulations that we uh, have validate these results. So to do that, we're going to use two simulations and quantitatively explore diurnal oscillations using two high resolution simulations of tropical cyclones in WARF. The first is Hurricane Nature Run 1, which um, my advisor David Nolan did with some of his students in 2013. This has been extensively validated in many studies. The second simulation is um, Hurricane Florence in 2018, and uh, I did this. And um, it's a simulation of a realistic hurricane using re um, era five reanalysis data as input. Um, and we want to do that so we have an analog with which to compare Hurricane Nature Run 1. So we want a realistic hurricane to compare Hurricane Nature Run 1. And the Hurricane Florence domains were designed to extend to higher radii with a high resolution so that we can capture as much of the diurnal pulse as possible. Um, so the innermost Florence domain extends further and at higher resolution than the three kilometer domain of Hurricane Nature Run 1. We have three versions of the, of the Florence simulation, one with a domain top that goes to 20 kilometers height um, to have a direct analog with which to compare HNR1. The second with a domain top of 20 kilometers but using the Thompson microphysics scheme instead of the WARF um, six class double moment scheme. And then the third one is with a domain top of 30 kilometers to prevent any waves being trapped by the upper domain boundary and explore the lower stratosphere a little bit. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about the first one, the domain top of 20 kilometers, um, but we have many versions of this simulation. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about Hurricane Nature Run 1. 
It was done in 2013, and what it is is a high resolution simulation of a hurricane that formed in the ECMWF joint OSSE nature run. So uh, ECMWF did a global nature run um, of the climate from January 2005 to February 2006. There was a hurricane that cropped up there on July 28th, and the hurricane nature run is um, a simulation in wharf of that hurricane. So the simulation is performed in wharf with four grids. The outermost grid has a 27 kilometer resolution and it covers most of the North Atlantic. The nested grids have nine, three and one kilometer resolution under vortex following. The tropical cyclone formed on uh, July 28th and dissipated after August 10th. And it, for, uh, it followed this path right here where it propagated northwestwards and then recurved. Um, we are only going to use the period from August 3rd to August 9th, which is when the um, hurricane nature run one was at hurricane intensity. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Florence simulation that I did. So this is a high resolution simulation in wharf of Hurricane Florence, which happened in 2018, and it uses hourly era five data as input on the outer domain. So um, the uh, Hurricane Florence formed as an, as an easterly wave um, in August 30th, um, 2018, it propagated north northwestward and it had two life cycles of intensity. So it intensified over the course of several days and then it weakened again to a tropical storm. And then it intensified again before it made landfall in North Carolina. So uh, we chose to go for the second life cycle, if you will, um, from whenever it weakened to a tropical storm and uh, as it was approaching landfall, because this is the, a fairly similar track and location to um, Hurricane Nature Run 1. So we initialized WARF at um, 00 UTC on September 7th, and uh, the simulation track in WARF is shown here. So the real track is this one on the bottom, and then the WARF track is this one. So you can see that the track is a little different, but the intensity has been fairly accurately reproduced. So the wharf simulation here uh, propagates northwestwards towards North Carolina. It's a little, it's consistently displaced north of the real track, but what can you do? And uh, the simulation completed as uh, we ran it out for seven days to 00 UTC, um, September 14th. So uh, we ignored the first day of input of output from the wharf simulation because it was still very weak. And we ignored the last day as it was getting close to land. So we only used the period from September 8th to 13th when it was um, reasonably, when it was at hurricane intensity, but there's also enough days for us to get like valuable results of the diurnal cycle out of this. So we take these two hurricane simulations, Hurricane Nature Run 1 and Hurricane Florence and perform two types of analysis on it in azimuthly averaged space. So everything here we're gonna do is axisymmetric again. The first, is we um, use empirical orthogonal functions. And for those of you who aren't that familiar with it, it's essentially the dominant spatial patterns of changes about the mean. Um, so it just tells you that the main modes of variability um, in a mathematical sense. And then for our EOFs, we remove a 24 hour moving mean from each grid point in radius height space so that we're operating on anomaly fields instead of, um, instead of the raw fields. Um, the second method that we used for analysis is Fourier analysis. Um, so we performed a Fourier transform on each point in radius height space to find the amplitude of the diurnal cycle at each point. And um, we also wanted to uh, look at the phase of the diurnal cycle at each point. So these two things together tell us a lot about um, the spatial variability of the diurnal cycle and the amplitudes and uh, phase of um, the changes. So this can tell us about mechanisms. So I'm going to show you some results now. And for everything I'm going to show you, it's going to be in one of two formats. So on the left, um, the plots are radius is the x-axis and height is the y-axis. The um, eye wall is right around here. The cirrus canopy is up here and the eye is there. There's going to be a line on there, which looks like this, which is the radius of maximum wind. And that tells you where the winds are strongest at any given height. So this is a uh, format number one, which are these radius height plots. And then um, on, on the right is the other format, which are half molar plots. So it's going to be half molars always with a radius on the x-axis and then time on the y-axis. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to group all the results by time of day. So um, I'm going to tell you how things change in a diurnal context at each time of day. And uh, we find at each time of day, there is something interesting to look at. 
So around sun sunrise in both Hurricane Nature Run 1 and Florence, we find a squall line forms that then propagates upwards. Um, so what I'm showing you on the left, excuse me, is a half molar of the rain mixing ratio, excuse me, at a height of four kilometers. So again, on the x-axis, we have radius. On the y-axis, we have time. And these are all in local times, by the way. So uh, this is showing you the rain mixing ratio, and you can see the eye wall right around here. But if you look closely, you can also see these propagating features here. So if you follow this line, you can see that there's a, uh, it appears that there's a propagating feature there and there, but it's a little bit hard to see. So what we did is for every radius, we removed a 24 hour moving mean um, to get the anomalous fields. And that looks like this. So the green colors are showing you um, anomalously high rain and the brown colors are showing you anomalously low rain. And you can kind of see the squall a little bit better. So you can see one here, it forms um, very early in the day and propagates outwards. You can see one there, you can see one there. So you can see that there is a diurnal cycle to the amount of rain. Um, but we're not really satisf satisfied with that. Um, so what we're gonna do now is for every radius, we're gonna um, Fourier filter, which means that we're gonna remove all frequencies that aren't di diurnal. And so you end up with something that looks kind of whack, which is this. Um, so this is a half molar of the rain mixing ratio that has been filtered for exactly the diurnal frequency. And so you can see um, several things here. So uh, the green colors are again showing you higher uh, rain mixing ratio um, and of a di exactly diurnal frequency. So every day, right around the start of the day, you have a squall that forms here. It propagates outwards, amplifies as it does so, and it reaches its maximum intensity around 200 kilometers radius. And then it continues propagating outwards over the course of the day and weakens. Um, in the eye wall, you can see that there is a diurnal cycle, but it's a slightly different phase. So that um, during the middle of the day, whenever this, the um, rain band squall is at its strongest, the eye wall rain is at its weakest. And then around sunset is whenever the um, eye wall rain is at its strongest. So we'll zoom into an individual day just to make it a little bit easier to look at. So here is the exact same plot, but just looking at one specific day. And so you can see here, um, this squall forming around 160 kilometers radius, propagating outwards, amplifying, and then as it continues to propagate, it weakens. Um, so out of interest, we calculated how the uh, translation speed of this system. And um, we find that it propagates at 3.97 knots. And so the main result that we find here is that um, at sunrise, we have a squall that forms in the rain bands that propagates outwards. And this is the same squall that is seen in observations um, by Ditchek and co in 2019A and B. Um, so Sarah Ditchek, who is at CMIS, I think, <clears throat> uh, finds that there is a diurnal squall seen in, obs in lightning observations of real hurricanes. And this confirms um, that the Hurricane Nature Run has been able to find this diurnal squall. Um, so yes, there's two diurnal cycles of rain and the squall propagates at uh, 3.97 knots. So let's have a look at Hurricane Florence and see if we see the same thing. Generally speaking, all of the diurnal uh, variability in Hurricane Florence is a lot weaker. And it's possible that that is because it's a weaker storm or that it's smaller or that it's not capturing the ice mixing ratio correctly. Um, but a lot of the diurnal variability is there. It's just a little bit weaker. So you can see the same at uh, the half molar of rain mixing ratio at four kilometers height, and you can see the eye wall here, but it's a little bit harder to see um, the uh, squall feature. So if we remove the 24 hour moving mean like we did before, again, very hard to see. So, um, and so obviously I wasn't satisfied with this. So I uh, did the uh, Fourier filtering like we did before. And you can see it won only once you do the Fourier filtering, you can see that the squall is there. It's just a lot weaker. Um, so once again, you have this squall that forms, um, in this case, at a lower radius of 100 kilometers because Hurricane Florence is smaller. And it propagates outwards, amplifies. And then uh, as it continues to propagate outwards, it weakens some more. And you can see that there is a diurnal cycle of rain in the eye wall that's of roughly the same phase as in Hurricane Nature Run 1. So if we zoom into an individual day again, we can see the squall forming at 100 kilometers and propagating outwards. And interestingly, it has pretty much exactly the same phase speed as in uh, Hurricane Nature Run 1. Um, so in Hurricane Nature Run 1, we find um, it was 3.97 knots, and here it's 3.95. Uh, this was largely done by eye, so it might just be an accident, but I, it does seem that um, this squall appears to be ubiquitous across all the simulations that we have done. So it seems to be a real thing. So um, 
now we'll move on to midday and at midday we find that the uh, radial wind speeds uh, are very strongly affected by the diurnal cycle. So this is showing you EOF1, the first leading EOF for radial wind. And uh, this means that most of the variance of radial wind is explained by this mode, or 56.7% of the variance is explained by this mode. And so uh, on the top plot, you're seeing um, the, EO, the spatial EOF in radius height space. And on the bottom, you're seeing the principal component time series in blue. And then uh, just out of interest, I filtered the um, pr uh, principal component time series for the exactly diurnal frequency so that you could find this, the time of day at which it maximizes. And you can see that it maximizes at around noon local time. So around noon local time, you have much stronger radial outflow um, some mid-level inflow, and then um, the, the surface inflow, there's a positive anomaly to it. So the surface inflow is a little bit weaker in the middle of the day than it is at night. So uh, we know from this that every day at noon, the outflow is about two times as strong. The in, there's inflow in the mid-levels and the surface inflow is weaker. So we wanted to compare this to observations just to see if this is a real thing too. And uh, it is. So here, um, Zhang and Co in 2020 used 2,242 drop sounds in 20 major hurricanes. And uh, this, th what they find in this exact radi uh, radial range um, from, sorry, 250 to 300 kilometers, they find um, that uh, in the morning local time, the radial inflow is much stronger, but around noon local time, the radio, uh, radial inflow at the surface is much weaker. And that is exact, pretty much exactly the same as we have found here and curiously, almost exactly the same amplitude too. So we, we have about two or three meters per second uh, weaker um, during the middle of the day, and they have about the same. So uh, that's a very neat result that um, at midday in Hurricane Nature Run 1, we have weaker surface inflow, and that is seen in observations um, of major hurricanes as well. Um, so the, I'm showing you now the exact same thing for Hurricane Florence. For reference, Hurricane Nature Run 1 is shown on the left, but a little transparent so that you don't focus on it. On the right is the exact same image for Hurricane Florence. And if you look at the principal component time series, you can see that it's a little messy. Um, but for the most part, the diurnal variability is obviously still there. It peaks around the same time and has a very similar spatial pattern where you have radial inflow in the mid-levels or anomalous inflow in the mid-levels, radio outflow at the um, level of the cirrus canopy. But unfortunately, Florence does not appear to accurately capture what goes on at the um, at the surface inflow and that most of the circulation appears to be top heavy in Florence. Something else we find at midday in both simulations is that the cirrus canopy uh, moves up and down. So um, this is EOF1 for ice. And so the green colors are showing you that there's more ice during the middle of the day in the upper part of the cirrus canopy. And then at night, um, there's more ice in the lower part of the cirrus canopy. So the cirrus canopy literally moves up and down in uh, Hurricane Nature Run 1. It also does it in Hurricane Florence, but I want to I want to really convince you that this is true. So what we did is we calculated the height of the cirrus canopy, and that is shown here. Um, so on we have radius on the x-axis and we have time on the y-axis, and the colors are showing you the height of the cirrus canopy. So the red colors are about 15 kilometers, the blue colors are about nine. And so you can kind of see a little bit that there's um, you know, these peak, these. Uh, diurnal oscillations in the height of the cirrus canopy. You can actually see it a little bit more clearly in Florence where you can see the radial extent of the cirrus canopy oscillates in and out over the course of the day. So during the middle of the day, um, the cirrus canopy extends to a larger radius, which we know to be true from observations. So the cirrus canopy moves up during the day and extends to a larger radius. Um, on the bottom, I'm showing you on the x-axis is radius and on the y-axis is the amplitude of the height oscillation. Um, so uh, in the in Hurricane Nature Run 1, the cirrus canopy moves up and down by about 300 meters amplitude. Um, in Florence, it moves up and down by between uh, 100 and 500 meters. Um, so you can see that it cuts off here. That's because the time, the time series is incomplete where um, the cirrus canopy technically doesn't exist in the middle of the night at these radii. Um, and then if we look at the times of the daily maximum, you can see um, here uh, the time at which, at which the cirrus canopy reaches its maximum height is around 12 local time um, for the entire cirrus canopy. Um, and then if we look at Hurricane Florence, you can see there's a little bit of a blip here, I'm not sure what's going on there. 
but most of the cirrus canopy reaches its maximum height in the middle of the day. So what this implies to me is that the change in area of the cirrus canopy is not an advective feature. So it, it seems to literally lift up and down, but it doesn't seem as though ice is vected from the center of the hurricane to the edge, because if that were true, then the, um, the, the uh, cirrus canopy would reach its maximum height at later times in outer radii than in the inner radii. So this would be a fairly linear line if it was an advective feature. So I personally do not believe that it's, it's an advective feature and that the cirrus canopy instead literally is lifted up and down by solar heating. At sunset, there is a, um, we have some signal in Hurricane Nature Run 1 of some weak intensification um, in the eye wall by about three meters per second at sunset and in the outflow a tangential wind anomaly um, of several meters per second at sunset and then the propagating squall feature. But then if we look at um, Florence on the right hand side, the entire uh, wind field does appear to have a um, intensification diurnal cycle, but it peaks at a different time of day. So for both of these, there is a diurnal cycle in intensification, but they seem to be at different times of day. So truth be told, I'm not entirely convinced. Um, so uh, I've shown you that there is a oscillation in the tangential wind speed in the um, in the cirrus canopy. And if you remember, I mentioned earlier, one of the ideas for the diurnal pulse was whether um, the an oscillation in the inertial stability um, in the cirrus canopy could be responsible for the diurnal pulse. So out of interest, I calculated um, the inertial stability for every time and then looked at the amplitude of the diurnal cycle of that. And so the red colors are showing you where there's a really strong uh, diurnal change in the inertial stability and the blue colors are showing you where there's virtually nothing. And so you can see it's really heavily saturated. And even if it's really heavily saturated, there's still really not that much going on in the cirrus canopy um, with regards to inertial stability. So in my opinion, um, the inertial stability does not change enough over the course of a day to be responsible for this diurnal pulse. So uh, this mechanism here, nope. So uh, just to bring everything together, because I've shared a huge amount of information with you today, um, we have the secondary circulation that looks like this. During the day, the, um, so the cirrus canopy is heated up. That causes it to physically move upwards. And it also causes stronger radial outflow, weaker surface inflow, and uh, upward motion in the eye wall. And then we have a little bit of uh, mid-level inflow and we have a squall that forms in the inner core and propagates outwards over the course of one day. At night, we have radiative cooling of the cirrus canopy, which uh, changes the local lapse rate and causes a um, maximum in deep convection, um, very strong surface inflow, a uh, possible intensification of the storm in, in and around the time of local sunset, and then um, the outflow will be a little bit weaker and there will be accordingly some substance. And uh, if you remember back to the figure that I showed you at the start of this section from um, Rupert and O'Neill in 2019, you can see that our results pretty much perfectly match theirs, um, even though they used a completely different model setup. So we know that hurricanes have a huge amount of diurnal variability. During the day, the storm expands upwards, a squall line forms and radiates outwards. We have two diurnal cycles of rain, um, sunset in the eye wall and sunrise to midday in the rain bands. Oops. And we have stronger upper level outflow and weaker surface inflow. And this could, uh, this could change the diurnal filtering of um, convective gravity waves and uh, change the momentum flux into the stratosphere. Overnight, we have stronger surface inflow, the outflow moves down and uh, the tangential winds intensify. These results are extremely consistent with other modeling studies and observations like Ditchek and Co. A, uh, 2019 A and B, Rupert and Hohenegger uh, 2018, Rupert O'Neill 2019, and Jang and Co 2020, which is neat. And so finally, just for a few minutes, I'm going to share with you what we intend to do um, before I defend, uh, which will be chapter three, which is how does the diurnal cycle in tropical cyclones affect gravity waves propagating into the stratosphere? So what we know is that diurnal heating produces gravity waves and deep convection and outflow wind shear vary diurnally. So the sources and filtering of wind shear vary diurnally. So what we would like to know is how do these two factors interact to influence gravity wave propagation into the stratosphere? So this is again, mostly conjecture. Um, so this is the idea. So we have diurnally varying heat sources. We have eye wall convection, uh, which peaks around sunset, rain band convection, which peaks in the mid morning, cirrus canopy and eye wall radiative heating producing high frequency waves at sunrise and sunset. So with lots of diurnally varying sources. So we have, um, we have waves that could come from the rain bands 
of various frequencies and they would radiate like so. And they would possibly encounter the outflow. So depending on the strength of the outflow, they may be uh, filtered more strongly at specific times of day. We have waves that would come from the eye wall. Some of them would make it uh, into the stratosphere. Some might be filtered by the outflow as well, depending on where they came from. And then we have waves that would come from the cirrus canopy and those would be mostly above the outflow. So they probably wouldn't be that filtered by it and would be affected by other things instead. So we have diurnally varying filtering and we have diurnally varying sources. So uh, waves from each source will be different filteredly depending on where they come from. And that filtering will depend on the time of day. So what we want to do is take the simulations of Hurricane Florence and Wharf and extend the domain top to 60 kilometers so that we can capture as much of the stratosphere as possible. Um, and this would give us a reputable comparison with satellite data. The simulations already exist, um, but I haven't been able to achieve the vertical grid spacing that I would like yet. So the idea is that we'll turn radiation schemes on and off to see the influence on gravity wave production, analyze the properties of the waves at different heights, and calculate momentum fluxes at different times of day. Um, I have done some preliminary work on this just to see if the waves are, oh, that's glitchy, um, see if the waves are accurately produced. And uh, we have a hurricane here. And as it propagates outwards, you can see these spiral waves um, in the stratosphere. So this is at a height of 30 kilometers, um, 10 kilometers above the tropopause. And you can see um, that these waves do indeed exist in wharf. So that's neat that we've been able to capture those. And with that, I think I will finish. So um, using a linear model, in chapter one, we have shown that diurnal heating produces a broad spectrum of waves in tropical cyclones. Low frequency um, uh, responses are balanced, high frequency responses are radiating. Lower frequency uh, responses are largely confined to the inner core uh, when they're produced in the eye wall. Diurnal, uh, the diurnal pulse in the cirrus canopy appears to originate from heating in the cirrus canopy itself. In chapter two, we showed using a nonlinear model that there are uh, in multiple simulations that diurnal oscillations are prevalent throughout tropical cyclones with most variables having different spatiotemporal evolution. So at sunrise, we have the squall. At midday, we have the lifting of the cirrus canopy and the strengthening of the radial outflow. And at sunset, there may be a weak intensification. So all this paints a picture that these uh, together provide a complex, complex picture of diurnal modulation of gravity waves and tropical cyclones due to the many sources and filters of gravity waves, each diurnally varying in their own way. And with that, I will take any questions. I've been speaking forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Rebecca. I know it's more than we've talked in uh, Ooh, six months. It honestly is. My voice. So let's thank Rebecca, give her a um, virtual round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to move on to the question and answer phase. Uh, if anybody has a question, um, you can unmute yourself, ideally. Um, otherwise, you can ask it in the chat, and I will say it out loud. Hi, Rebecca. Um, I have a, just one question. It's kind of an open-ended, like, um, your thoughts. Um, I'm not really um, familiar with this, but you did mention that your sort of conjecture lined up with some um, recent you know, modeling studies and observational studies. And so I guess my question is, could you elaborate a bit more on sort of where it lines up with those studies? And do you have any, I guess, thoughts on how one would go about looking for this in observations in the future? Um, so do you mean in the last part with the um, stratosphere stuff? Uh, I was more referring to the second um, chapter two. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, the thing that's a little frustrating about that is that the intensification signal would be very hard to pick up on in observations because I just don't think that we have a uh, data set that we would be of high enough uh, temporal resolution that would be able to pick up on such small amplitude changes because they're only about three meters per second. Um, but the rest of it, I feel like. Uh, would definitely be able to be picked up on. So Sarah Ditchak has been doing a lot of work on the diurnal squall. And um, so she now has several studies, including one on Hurricane Harvey, where it's confirmed to exist. And I don't know if you remember the map discussion of Hurricane Laura, um, but there was somebody mentioned in the map discussion of Hurricane Laura that there was the uh, diurnal squall propagating feature as seen in lightning. So for observations, you can definitely see the squall. For the lifting of the cirrus canopy, um, I'm not really sure I don't, I don't know that anyone has um, done that in observations, but I know that it has been found in, in uh, simulations before, like the Rupert ones. Um, so I'm not really too sure how you could do that observationally. 
Mm -hmm. um, for some of the things that are a little bit more ambiguous, like if there is an intensification signal and exactly when it happens in the day. Um, yeah. So I'm not really sure on that, but for, for the other stuff, like the squall, you can definitely do. And um, mm -hmm. the Cirrus canopy height, I feel like would be doable, but I just don't know if anyone's tried. Yeah, that's that was interesting because I've seen some of Sarah's papers on the um, the squall, but was curious uh, a lot about the Cirrus um, lifting. Great talk, by the way. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Does anybody else have a question? I have a yes, question. Jill. Yeah, about this. Hi. <laughs> about the squall. Uh, you found, you know, you did, you set the period essentially. You filtered for diurnal frequency. Mm -hmm. And you found uh, a consistent speed, mm -hmm. uh, and the phase speed is what you're observing there. So um, phase speed is frequency over wave number, mm -hmm. and so it implies the wave number or the, the horizontal scale, radial scale is also the same. So I'm wondering, oh, yeah. do you think, uh, what do you think? Why do you think the speed is the same? Is there a mechanism that would make the speed be the same, or is there a mechanism? that might pick the horizontal scale, because either one would give you uh, the same speed. Um, that's an interesting question. So we, uh, Dave and I have been talking a lot about why it uh, intensifies as it propagates outwards. And so I'm just gonna, I realized that I skipped that. I was meant, meant, to, meant to say it earlier, that um, the, there was an idea of, um, so the rain bands and the eye wall are normally competing for moisture. Um, but if it's able to uh, propagate out of the subsidence zone outside the eye wall, then it might be able to um, not be competing so much with the eye wall moisture anymore and be able to intensify at larger radii. Um, as for the horizontal scale, I haven't really thought about that, honestly. That's a really good question, though. Um, Dave, do you have any ideas? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Back to my question about why well, it would be so consistent in horizontal scale. Uh, we could separately try to address the horizontal scale and see if it matches the observations. Although we actually don't really yeah. have good observations of the horizontal scale of the actual convection region because you need reflectivity out there and we don't have that consistently. Hmm. I don't know. That's a great question. I'm going to write that down. Okay. All right. I know. Um... Rebecca's committee is meeting after this, but I just have one more question about what our weekend looks like in Miami with Hurricane Ada. Any predictions? Ooh. <laughs> uh, oh, oh boy. <laughs> um, you don't have to answer it, that. It's, uh, I, I honestly haven't really looked that much, um, but I, I, believe no that we are, I believe that we are in the cone and are expected to have possibly tropical storm conditions by then. Um, but I, I don't really know that that much further than that. I feel bad. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no worries at all. All right. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, it was a great talk. Um, and check in with Rebecca if you have any other questions. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye.